years ago festival. So glad to see all of you here in person. And for those of you watching on Zoom, uh, there is no Zoom. You're watching on YouTube. <laughs> You're not doing this live. But uh, very happy to be uh, hosted by our friends with Sunset Memorial Park here today in the beautiful Chester T. French Memorial Mausoleum Chapel. And there's the man. He's right up there. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Chester French started French funerals in, correct me if I'm wrong, 1907? Correct! Yay! And it has been a locally owned funeral home uh, ever since. And uh, Chester started this cemetery, I want to say 1929? Yes! <laughs> wow. Yay! And it's a beautiful memorial park. Uh, some of you got a chance to take a little tour with the, uh, on the golf cart. Uh, they have done wonderful things with not only burial, but also cremation. This was the spot of the first scatter day where uh, people who had cremated remains in their closets at home, uh, wanting to give that a final resting place, uh, one day out of the year, and they did it two years in a row and then they took a break, but I know you'll be doing it again, uh, to uh, place for free the cremated remains of your loved ones in either the ossuary, which was just north of the pavilion where we just had our, our mortuary ball and lunch, and uh, in fact, I'll tell you a secret. Two of Gail Rubin's past boyfriends cremated remains are there in the, in the Kiva ossuary. Uh, yes, it's Gail's ex-boyfriend collection. <laughs> uh, but also, just to the east of this mausoleum, there's a rose garden. And if people wanted to scatter in the rose garden, they could do that as well. And then it's, it's free placement. You get uh, the loved one's name and dates on either a brick on the plaza near the kiva or on a wall next to the rose garden. And it's a wonderful thing for people to be able to give a permanent final resting place to cremated remains because, as you know, they are portable. <laughs> they can be stolen. Why anybody would want them, nobody knows. But, you know, the urns can be very elaborate and somebody says, oh, what a pretty urn. I think I will take this out of your car if you're driving it around. It's happened here. So um, I applaud French and Sunset for doing the Scatter Day project. It's, it's an idea they have offered to other cemeteries around the country. It's a great way to give those cremated remains a permanent final resting place and then also to create a connection between those families and the cemetery. So with that background, uh, I would like to introduce who's speaking first. <laughs> okay, uh, Chris, Crystal. So, how does the process start with the funeral director taking the information? It does. It starts at the funeral home. So, in our case, it goes through French funerals. They take care of all the paperwork. So, they meet with the families, get every um, initial signature from the families first. And then we are the ones that double check paperwork. So, we make sure that the correct next of kin signs, we make sure that POA paperwork or a will or self-authorization is included in that paperwork for us to do the cremation to do the whole process from there. I heard that if a family does a cremation with French that you include the scatter day placement 
here as part of that. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes, so families will come into the office, they'll present a certificate, and then we allow the families to choose where they would like their loved one's name engraved. Um, it's mostly first name and last name, um, and then it takes a couple of weeks, but once it's completed, families can come and visit their loved one. So it's kind of a nice little area. Yeah. How many people are, when, with the paperwork that you see, uh -huh. are people choosing placement or are they saying, no, we're just going to take it and scatter the remains? I think it depends, really. It depends. Um, yeah. A lot of families, believe it or not, will just want to scatter their loved one. Um, families will just want to do the engraving for their loved one here to have a special place. Um, others' families will come in and love the cemetery and buy property around the cemetery either a niche in the mausoleum, in the urn garden. So it just really depends on families. Is, uh, is it appropriate for you to answer this question or somebody else on the staff about the range of what you offer here for cremated remains? Uh, probably one of the FFCs might be better to answer that. Um, I mean, families can scatter by property, but they probably have more information on that than I do. What, actually, what Crystal was stating, you, we, uh, you, you do a, a service through French, and they present the family with a cenotaph, cenotaph certificate. The family can come into the park, we meet with them, and uh, offer them a free engraving somewhere in the park. There's, there's several different places that they get to choose. Um, and then we talk to them about a permanent a home for their loved one. So many people just, they don't, they're, they're not sure what their options are. And we know that a great many households across the country have, are, are cemeteries. There are, there are human or pet remains in those homes. And, and you know, after, after we go, who's going to be there to care for that, that urn? And so, you know, when you, when you kind of explain that, uh, that to, to a family, then they start thinking about a long-term solution. And that's where our family service counselors will come in. Crystal will reach out to them and uh, get it all, help get it all scheduled. Uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll um, show them their options. So at Sunset, we've got a lot of, a lot of choices. You can do a in-ground cremation burial. Um, and you can do that actually um, um, uh, in different places in the park. You can do, um, you can do a niche. And we have a couple different choices there. We have a traditional outdoor niche, which has a solid granite plate. So you'll put the, the name and the dates and so forth. And sometimes it'll line of endearment. Um, and then we have a lot of options in our mausoleum for an indoor niche. Um, and we've actually added a tremendous amount of new property in the last 24 months, um, given in both outdoor and indoor, because cremation is just becoming you know, the, the most popular, popular. popular choice for for so many families um, across across the country, so and if you select an indoor niche, you can take some memorabilia, some important items, some photos, and place in that urn. I mean, and if I had a preference, the, that's what I would. Because it's glass front. It, it's it's yeah. usually acrylic. Sometimes they're glass. Yeah, we have okay. it both ways. But some are glass, some are acrylic, and you can really kind of customize that. And I worked with a family a couple months ago in what we call our times and seasons area, and that's. Uh, uh, a niche room, uh, this glass uh, in there, and we spent you know 30 or 40 minutes in it, you know arranging that niche before we closed it up, and, and this family had way more, way more um, um, uh, valuable loved items that they, they could fit in there. So <laughs> we had to make some hard decisions and choices, but yeah. we finally found a solution and got everything in there that was really important. So when they come back and visit, it's just a, it's a, it's a really neat place to come. It's, it's their place. Well, it's like almost a little life diorama that they can come and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you also have something new that you established outside the Centennial Garden, the uh, underground family niche tubes. Absolutely. It's Talk called, a little bit about it's, that. It's called an in-ground burial niche. And uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a, kind of a, a cross between a traditional grave, a tra traditional burial, and a cremation burial. So it, 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 you have, a, you have a, a cover on, on the top, it's slanted, um, and they're all slanted the same direction. You do your, your names and dates and endearment on, on, on like you would a headstone, a traditional headstone. Um, and then uh, 
it opens up and you have a vault and you can put an entire family there and you can add to it as you have the need to add additional members of the family in there as well. So it's just a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a new take on things and it's just a new, a new um, uh, solution for a lot of families. But what, what, what Crystal and her team do here um, at Sunset is just an absolutely critical function. I mean, they are, our, they, they, they dot our I's, they cross our T's, we have to work within state guidelines. We have to work. We have to protect. They work to protect the funeral home to make sure they haven't missed anything. They protect Sunset. They protect the family by making sure everything is complete before we can move forward with the with the cremation process. Well, and with cremation in New Mexico, we have the Office of the Medical Investigator. Talk about that piece. Well, <laughs> so, go ahead. I mean, we don't have contact with the OMI. Um, mainly it's the directors, but it's very crucial to have all our permits correct, um, specifically names and date of births and ages, because that is a document that doesn't get destroyed. It goes, continues on with your loved one's um, cremated remains. So it is a way to say this is the correct person in the park. So it is very important to have that. And it, there is a fee for that. There is. I am one. not quite sure exactly what that fee is. I, I think it's like $235 at this point. Probably. I yeah. think it's the most expensive, actually. In, in the country. country? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But our death certificates are just five bucks each. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We need lots of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But Crystal and her team, um, they also, they also uh, they're not attorneys. They're not right. licensed attorneys. <laughs> but my gosh, they're pretty darn close. You know, they have to make some, they have to clearly identify a chain of, a proper chain who can make those decisions to authorize that cremation and you know whether that's who the next of kin is who has power of attorney uh, many times we deal with families that the, uh, the spouse is incapacitated so there's a power of attorney that may be in place or may not be one in place and so we have to they have to make some some you know follow that chain figure out who those um, those people are that can make the decisions and often we reach out to legal counsel I, I was going to say, isn't there in New Mexico that you can sign your own uh, cremation okay. permit or will? Yes. Yeah. You can. And, a, and a lot of times that's done in the pre-planning process. Yes. As yeah. long as we will accept it as long as it is notarized or witnessed by two people. Uh, as long as that is completed, then we will accept that paperwork saying that you wish to be cremated. And, and you've actually had some challenges with people who want to be cremated, but they never wrote it down anywhere, yeah. and and there's fighting family there's that gets... There's always those situations. Yeah. It gets complicated after a while. It, it does get complicated, <laughs> but the park's position is to, we, we tend to remove ourselves from those situations. We, we will present the family with all the options, we'll, we'll tell them kind of what the legal ramifications are, and what, what the parameters they have to work within, and we allow them the time to make their own decision and come back and, and we'll execute their wishes at that time. How long does it sometimes take to get that straightened out before a cremation can take place? It can take a couple days, it can take a couple weeks. We've had cases that we waited a couple months, it really, really depends. <laughs> That's a lot of refrigeration fees. Yes, it is. <laughs> it kind of seems like, Crystal, it kind of seems like sometimes the amount of, the, the number of family members involved. Sometimes yes. the larger families, that's, complicated. That's, that's when things really can drag out. Yeah, bit. usually if it's, let's say, one parent or one daughter, it's a lot easier. Once you involve five siblings, five kids, six kids, then it gets really, really complicated after that. <laughs> It does. <laughs> and in a lot of times, and we have, uh, you know, we also have, we have to work through language barriers too. We, yeah. you know, yeah. we serve many nationalities here at the park. We, we, you know, so and Crystal and her and, and some of her teammates help us with that as well. So you have to kind of really take things slowly and make sure everyone fully understands everything. So. Are there lo local translators that you work with? Well, I speak Spanish, and so does my coworker Diana. And that I think that's always. Been I don't think we've ever had anyone speak 
French or anything that we need to know about. Okay. Yeah, just Spanish. <laughs> they, they do us a valuable service. And yeah. It's always it's so it's so wonderful that that they have that gift because um, you know they understand the process. And they really understand what they're talking about versus a, a translator. So. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. I have a question. Um, so my twin sister pre-paid for her cremation and all that. And then she went to Wisconsin for her boys, and she suddenly had a second guy in Wisconsin. And um, I was not really in, involved in what you're talking about. Is, but when I called the cremation, they said, oh yeah, um, even though it was purchased in Mexico, we honored that. Is that, is that a normal thing that if someone buys a, a package here in New Mexico and go visits family and all of a sudden dies, is there an interstate thing? What happens? Well, there's a, there's a couple of um, umbrella agencies yes. would be the best way to describe them that work in premium. And those umbrella agencies, um, they have tentacles, if you will, in all 50 states. And they have thousands of funeral homes they work with. And so a lot of times there's reciprocal agreements in place. So, and there's also some, um, and for burial though, um, some of those, when you do those pre needs, some of the, sometimes those pre needs include um, transportation from state to state, and sometimes they don't. So if they don't, then often the family has to incur that expense above and beyond whatever is said in the pre need whatever the pre need will cover. I do know that. So. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> well. Oh. Can you just walk us through step by step? I have someone in my family unexpectedly die and I come to you. What next? So you'd go directly to the funeral home. You would make an arrangement. You'd make an appointment meet with the director and they would show you paperwork um, if you wish to do cremation. So you would fill out this paperwork. Um, mainly it's just to verify name, you will initial everything that you agree. So if you have a casket, if you have a pacemaker, um, you'll verify that you are technically the Mexican. So we follow a checka, checka system. So the first one we would look at there is a cell pop. So let's say your loved one did sign a cell pop and it was witnessed by two people, they will accept it. Um, if they do not, then the next of kin would be the legal spouse. Um, after that, it would be, if I remember correctly, it should be legal, what is it right now? Spouse, the children, children, then parents, then siblings. So it goes down the line. Um, occasionally, we'll get paperwork where there is no what. So there's no spouse, no kids, no parents. Um, and we'll have to get the cousin to sign. That's the only next living kin. So um, you would sign all the paperwork. The directors go through the OMI, get permits. Then they would send the paperwork to us. We verify that everything on that paperwork is correct. Then we'll resubmit it to the director, letting them know, hey, this is OK. We can accept this case. And then it goes through transfers, transfers bring your loved one here to sunset, and then there's a whole process and Dave and Savannah can explain from there because they would do the check-in and then they would do the rest. That's we, the whole process. You know, to, to also add to, add to that, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, we very rarely touch the family during the process. Um, you're working, the family's working with the funeral home. We work, we're work. we working on the back end, working behind the scenes. So 98% of the time, you know, we're not, we're not working with the family directly. Now, when they get their cenotaph certificate and want to come to the park and talk to us about a permanent placement, that's when we start to work directly with the family at that point. So often the deceased will come to come come to the cemetery, come to come to the cremation center, go through the whole process, and then come back to us later um, um, for the for the second phase if they wish. So great question. It's a great question. When do we get to talk about pacemakers? <laughs> well, pacemakers, and, and Dave, Dave has a lot he'll talk to you about with pacemakers, or Dave's the manager of our crematory. Uh, he'll be up next, but um, the pacemakers are, are, are checked. They ask the funeral homes 
funeral directors will talk with families about pumps and pacemakers and mechanical devices. We find often that families, especially um, family members that aren't super close to the deceased, may or may not know. What, you know, and, and a lot of people, uh, myself included, will have medical procedures that I don't talk to anyone about it. So um, <laughs> you know, they, they have no idea, and, but they'll still they'll still check. No, we're not aware of any of these devices. You know, in, in our loved one. Um, but the, the funeral homes, will, they, they, have the, they have ways of technology to check for that as well. So, um, but it's important that those are removed because those, those do can cause damage and potential hazard to our crematory operators as the crematory process is, is ongoing. So. They explode. They explode. <laughs> they explode. Who removes them? I'm sorry? Who removes them? The funeral, the funeral records, though. Uh, and, and usually it's the, the, like the folks in the care centers and the embalm, the people that do the embalming and those kinds of things, they're the ones that are checking for that as well. So we don't always just take, they don't, I don't believe they take the, the word of the family. Mm -hmm. They'll also verify, which is a normal protocol. So. Well, excellent. I can't wait to hear about the details of the process. Well, that's what everybody's really. <laughs> <laughs> No, we're just the pre the, the, the pre talk. Right? <laughs> well, with that said, if we're ready, uh, here come our experts. <laughs>